So learning unit nine is on enzyme kinetics, inhibition, and regulation. And we're actually going to address um, this chapter in three lectures, sort of dealing um, directly with those um, three specific concepts. So again, a lecture period to discuss Michaelis Menten kinetics, a lecture period to discuss inhibition, and then a brief discussion sort of on drug design, and then um, a, uh, a lecture to discuss enzyme regulation, particularly uh, through covalent modification and then allosteric regulation using the example enzyme uh, glycogen phosphorylase. So we begin this chapter just reminding ourselves once again about a reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinates, again, have a difference in energies between reactants and products that tell us delta G. And when we think about delta G, we think about how much and whether. The how much part of delta G comes from the magnitude of the delta G value. And again, we can see that as it's translated into one of our equations, delta G equals minus RT ln of KEQ. So again, the ratio of product to reactant concentrations reflected in an equilibrium constant. So that's how the magnitude of delta G is translated into a how much product we make. And whether we make that product, whether this reaction is spontaneous, has to do with the sign of delta G. Again, if we're going downhill in energy, delta G is going to be negative. That reaction is said to be spontaneous. And again, that indicates, yes, that re that reaction does occur. When we think about the difference in energy between something that is stable, something that's in a valley, such as reactants or products, and we think about the difference in energy to the immediately adjacent transition state, we define that energy difference as delta G double dagger. And again, that is going to be a um, reflection of how fast the reaction occurs. So delta G double dagger reflects how fast a reaction occurs. Note that there is directionality to it. So if we talk about the uh, energy difference between uh, the reactants here and the transition state, this delta G double dagger reflects the rate of the forward reaction. We could similarly look at the energy uh, difference between the products here and the same transition state, but that would reflect the delta G double dagger or the rate of the reverse reaction. Uh, keeping in mind that most of the enzymatic reactions we are going to consider will be reversible, that's going to be an important concept to just kind of tuck in the back of your mind. So as we think about how enzymes work, and we studied this in our last learning unit on enzyme catalysis, generally enzymes facilitate reactions by doing something to help stabilize the transition state. And by stabilizing the transition state energy, we are lowering the overall energy that we have for delta G double dagger. And a smaller delta G double dagger means a faster reaction. Make sure again to note that we do not change delta G. We don't change the uh, stability, the inherent stability of the reactants or the products. So we don't change how much product we make and we cannot take a, a non-spontaneous reaction and make it spontaneous. Something else that's just worth kind of highlighting because it was something that was part of an in-class discussion. Remember, anytime you bind to something, that binding event creates intermolecular forces and that's stabilizing and so it becomes lower in energy. So we talked about this in the concept, in the context of enzyme binding to substrate. So if enzyme binds substrate and it binds substrate too tightly, this energy level goes down further. Remembering that the transition state energy difference, or the, ener the difference between the transition state energy and the immediately preceding kind of stabilized species, we actually have quite a large delta G double dagger to get out of this energy well, if you will, if we bind our uh, substrate too tightly. So again, that's an important concept to help us remember that enzymes work best when they bind to and stabilize the transition state, not specifically the substrate, but the transition state, so that they lower that energy and make the reaction go faster. Similarly, we're going to have a situation where enzyme bound to product is going to be more stable than enzyme uh, bound uh, or releasing product. So we're going to have an activation barrier so to sort of get over there in order to have product be released and allow this enzyme to turn over. So just kind of highlighting, you know, what we've learned so far and how that builds into this current chapter, uh, the, the field of enzymology is really studying the reactions of enzymes, and there's multiple components to it, right? We can think about sort of the uh, structure determination component to it. So learning about how we determine and uh, protein structure in chapter six, uh, 
is important because understanding that enzyme active site structure is going to be really important uh, to sort of mapping on residues for catalysis. And again, in chapter 11, we learned about how those um, well-positioned residues could sort of facilitate uh, catalysis. So we, we kind of culminate this uh, sort of three-part series here in terms of enzyme structure, enzyme catalysis, and now really understanding how uh, these reaction rates are going to change in response to different reactant concentrations. So why is all of this important? Why is the study of enzymology fundamentally important? Well, uh, at the end of the day, it often comes down to thinking about drug design. So there's a therapeutic benefit as uh, drugs are ultimately designed to uh, frequently inhibit an enzyme. So as we think about michaelis uh kinetics, uh, we want to think about uh, sort of this, this standard uh, chemical equation, if you really will, uh, for, for thinking about what happens here. So again, E being enzyme, S being substrate. Uh, enzyme and substrate are going to associate, and there's going to be a rate for that assembly that we define K1. We can think about this as being an on rate. And there's also a competing off rate. So enzyme kind of being released, uh, or substrate being released from enzyme. And so this equilibrium is really going to be an important reflection of what concentration of this Michaelis complex, this enzyme substrate complex, we effectively have. Again, this is a really important concept to remind ourselves of, is that binding and releasing is really a dynamic process. We talked about this in the context of doing column chromatography in, uh, in lab. And so the idea is, is that if the on rate is greater than the off rate, we're going to spend more time being bound to our column as a protein, or in this case, being bound as a substrate to our enzyme, which makes the chemistry step then much more um, uh, feasible. So again, K1 and K-1 are forward and reverse rate constants for enzyme binding and then releasing substrate. K2 is truly the uh, reaction rate that we're interested in. This is really the chemistry step, and that is the decomposition of enzyme uh, substrate complex to product and free enzyme. And just to kind of come back here and highlight, we're really simplifying this a little bit to make our lives easier and not really thinking about this as truly a three-step process. We are considering the pre-equilibrium to chemistry where we're having enzyme binding substrate and then this is really representing the chemistry step, but we're really sort of eliminating for um, simplicity's sake here, this idea that enzyme uh, will be bound to product, which then needs to release it. So for our uh, uh, enzyme kinetics here, we're really ignoring sort of the product dissociation step. So one of the important sort of um, uh, things that we'll consider here to make sort of the math of this reasonable to consider is the fact that we want to have saturating substrate. If we don't have high concentration of substrate, if we have subsaturating concentrations of substrate, then this on rate really is not going to dominate and we're really going to be looking at the rate really of this equilibrium here rather than the rate of the chemistry, which is really what we're interested in. And at the end of the day, uh, when we have high concentrations of substrate, then ultimately changing the concentration of, of substrate is really not going to uh, affect the reaction rate. The reaction rate ultimately becomes zero order with respect to substrate, and then we truly are looking at the rate constant for the chemistry step. So we've highlighted in, in class, and this was part of your homework, an important reaction that I want you to be able to write is this kind of gold standard reaction that we think about for um, enzyme kinetics. So if we kind of define uh, a little bit more in detail sort of what these three rate constants um, are, we can get to an equilibrium constant that we call the Michaelis constant. So not important for us to understand a lot of the details, but we can actually have a ratio of rate constants that reflects an equilibrium constant. Normally we only thought about equilibrium constants and we would talk about like products and reactants over here in terms of concentrations. But we actually can think about the rate constants that contribute to those concentrations. So an easy way to help remember sort of what Km is, is it really is reflecting, reflecting sort of the enzymes binding uh, substrate, the enzymes affinity for substrate. So it really has to do too with how much of this ES complex we have. And if we want to think about that, we can think about three things happening to that ES complex. We have two things that decompose that ES complex, either back to free enzyme and substrate or taking it onto product, and that's why these two rate constants are together up in the numerator here. 
One species contributes to the formation of ES, and so that rate constant is by itself down in the denominator. At the end of the day, when we think about this Michaelis constant, the Km, I want you to remember and think about two things. I want you to be able to define Km in terms of just a word's definition, and that's the enzyme's affinity for substrate. And again, we want to we can think about this kind of like a, a KD value. When we have a low KM value, that really means high affinity for enzyme. Now again, I want us to remember and just think back for a moment here. We're not necessarily saying that enzyme is going to bind very tightly for substrate. We're just saying that there's a high affinity for it. And as long as the enzyme binds the transition state tightly, as soon as this uh, enzyme binds its substrate, it will more quickly convert that enzyme substrate complex into product. Okay, so another equation that I am asking you to know is the Michaelis-Menten equation. So you need to be able to write down this equation and define the relative terms. So again, three terms that we really need to be able to define are something that we call V0, which reflects the reaction's initial velocity, Vmax, which represents the reaction's maximum velocity, and then Km, again, which we just spoke about, which is the enzyme's affinity for substrate. So this really tells us that how fast a reaction is going to go is dependent on the substrate concentration, the enzyme's affinity for substrate, and then how fast the reaction could maximally go. And part of your homework, too, is to think about limits for this. So for example, if we have a very um, high affinity for substrate, right, so Km is very small, then essentially we're going to say that Km plus S appro uh, approaches just S, then S can cancel and our reaction will approach its maximum velocity. So again, for an enzyme that binds uh, substrate very tightly, then we're going to be able to approach Vmax very easily. Similar, if we consider different concentrations of substrate. So for example, if we have you know, a fairly small uh, substrate concentration, then we, this, this uh, numerator is going to be fairly small, and that's going to mean that there's a small reaction velocity. And that kind of is intuitive. That makes sense. If we don't have a lot of substrate, we wouldn't expect the reaction to go very fast. And one important halfway point that we are going to talk about is this special situation where Km would equal the substrate concentration. So when Km equals the substrate concentration, Km plus S is equal to 2S. We're going to then have substrate concentrations cancel, and we're left with Vmax over 2. And so that reminds us that another way to define what Km is, is Km is the substrate concentration we need to be at for the reaction velocity to be half maximal. So I'll say that again because it's really important. When Km equals the substrate concentration, this whole uh, equation simplifies to 1 half Vmax. So when Km is equal to the substrate concentration, or said another way, Km represents the substrate concentration we need to be at for a reaction velocity to be 1 half of its maximum. So again, this is just another uh, way to look at this graphically. This is sort of what we call an initial velocity plot. And this is a plot that I'll say is sort of a make sense sort of plot. This has to do with increasing the substrate concentration and looking at the reaction's initial velocity. And so it makes sense. As we increase the substrate concentration, our reaction is going to go faster. So again, an important point to think about is when we are halfway to our maximum value, that represents a very special substrate concentration. So again, we talked about Km being, being the enzyme's affinity for substrate. But we can also think about Km as being the substrate concentration in which the reaction velocity is at half of its maximum value. We went through on the previous slide how to kind of do that mathematically. You can see how that plays out graphically. But we're going to highlight this in a minute. Finding the halfway point of the maximum value means that we can effectively determine what the maximum value is. Well, when does this line exactly stop increasing? And that's going to be a challenge to do when we look at this more intuitive plot. So we're going to talk about how we take this same data and interpret it a different way in order to effectively determine what this Vmax, Vmax value is. So again, kinetics in the lab, we may or may not have uh, gotten to this in the lab yet. But when we do kinetics in the lab, uh, we need to be able to get this initial uh, velocity. So again, this initial velocity is a kinetic parameter that we can measure. 
Substrate concentration is a parameter that we can measure. And we've just talked about two important kinetic parameters that we'd like to obtain are Vmax and Km. So again, we don't have ways of directly measuring how fast a reaction is or directly measuring, you know, kind of this uh, halfway point. But we can measure things that we can measure, like reaction velocity and substrate concentration. And then we can use some data interpretation to give us parameters that we're interested in. So to talk briefly about how we do that, again, if we're looking at um, plotting the concentration of either a product that's appearing or a reactant that's disappearing, in this case we're showing the appearance of a colored product, we'll see a straight line here in this initial velocity plot where we're going to see increase in the concentration of our substrate as a function of time. Now, in reality, this plot will probably level off at some point. But if we look at this initial reaction rate, it's going to be linear. Again, in the blue line here just kind of highlights that maybe we might see a colored substrate disappearing. We could also use this to get a reaction velocity. Remember that a reaction rate is really just a change in a function of a, of a, of a species as a function of time. So if we consider the change in the concentration of absorbance as a function of time, that's really change in y over change in x, that's the slope of this line. So by taking the slope of this line, we can get an initial velocity that represents one data point on this initial velocity plot. So each of these individual data points represents one reaction that's done at a different substrate concentration. So again, remembering that the goals of doing any kinetics experiments are to obtain the kinetic parameters Vmax and Km. How fast can this enzyme possibly go and what's its affinity for substrate? We have to measure things that we can measure reaction velocity and substrate concentration. And then we'll do some data interpretation in order to get some information, uh, get that information. So again, if we can plot things as a straight line, that's really important because we can get useful information about the slope, and we should say, and the y-intercept as well. So the second way that we can plot the same data, which is not necessarily as intuitive, is what we call the double reciprocal plot. And double meaning both, axes are shown as the reciprocal. So we have 1 over V naught and then 1 over substrate concentration. So if we take our michaelis menten equation, and you do not need to remember this one, this is the michaelis menten equation that I need you to know right here. But if we take the double reciprocal of this, this is what we get. Mathematically, you should be able to go and figure that out for yourself. But again, 1 over V naught is going to be our Y. Km over V max is going to be our M. Our x is 1 over the substrate concentration, and then our y-intercept is 1 over Vmax. So that's why we can get useful kinetic information from the slope and the uh, y-intercept of a line weaver berg plot. So a couple of things that are problematic with this is we put a lot of weight, um, you know, statistically and literally on this data point that's out here. You can see that with the large error bars that we typically have with this um, data point that it's going to have a significant impact on what the slope is. We have less variability really in what we see for the Vmax value, but again the slope is going to have some significant uh, variation and that's going to have a significant variation and error that we'll see in Km. Why do we see so much error with this data point? Remember that out here represents a very small concentration of substrate that generates a very slow reaction. So we're going to have a lot of noise in our kinetic data because we're not generating a very strong signal. We're not generating product very fast. So significant error bars that we see here, and that's unfortunately going to result in um, kind of a, uh, the ability of this line to move up and down, this blue line to move up and down within these error bars and significantly change the slope. So we didn't talk too much about this. We're really only going to discuss and, uh, and learn about the line weaver burke plot. But there's lots of other ways that you can manipulate data. There's the A.D. Hofstede um, uh, plot and haynes wolf plots, and also just more elaborate data, uh, data fitting programs that can take additional um, kind of looks at this data to give us the important kinetic parameters of Km and Vmax. So kind of summarizing what you need to know about michaelis menten kinetics, two equations kind of shown in uh, the boxed green here are the equations you need to be able to write, talk about the uh, variables that are there, talk about the limits that we might see for certain variables or assumptions that we make of them, 
Uh, don't worry too much right now about this K-cat. Uh, we just kind of discussed briefly that this is really the catalytic efficiency of a reaction and it, it has to do uh, with what the reaction's maximum velocity is and the total enzyme concentration. Don't worry too much about that one. We really didn't talk about that one too much. But that kind of is um, our summary of Michaelis Menten kinetics. We moved on then to discuss enzyme inhibition. And we discussed sort of two flavors of enzyme inhibition. We talked about inhibition where we're going to have a sub, uh, an inhibitor that competes directly for substrate binding, and then one that does not compete with substrate binding, but nonetheless somehow alters the enzymatic activity and uh, does not affect substrate binding, or as we'll see, um, kind of counterintuitively increases the affinity of the enzyme for substrate. So we're going to look at detail in both of those, but I kind of wanted to highlight the difference between what's defined as an inhibitor and an inactivator. Something that's an inhibitor, we consider something that is reversibly bound, so it could come off. Something that's an inactivator irreversibly binds, so it sort of permanently blocks the enzyme active site. One example that we've actually already learned about is when we learned about uh, the protease, um, serine proteases, and we learned about the uh, pancreatic trypsin inhibitor. We learned about uh, a protein that if it were to encounter trypsin in your bloodstream, would bind so tightly to it that it wouldn't come off and basically eliminates that from finding and uh, degrading any proteins that would be in your bloodstream, which again would be a huge problem. So for each of these kinds of inhibition, we're going to take sort of our gold standard equation that we learned about in blue with michaelis menten kinetics, and we're gonna talk about what happens if we have an off pathway option. So when we define on pathway, that really kind of talks about the, you know, the typical um, expected path that we expect an enzyme to take, which is to bind its substrate and convert it into product. In competitive inhibition, like the name implies, the enzyme really sort of has a choice. And keep in mind, even though we've discussed there being quote unquote choices for enzyme, enzymes and proteins aren't making choices. This all ultimately comes down to probability and statistics. What is this enzyme likely to encounter in solution? Substrate and be on pathway or inhibitor and be off pathway. So again, this off pathway is not going to allow for substrate to bind, so there's no reaction. And hopefully you can imagine if we are enzyme and we are in a sea of substrate with very little inhibitor, this is going to be the predominant pathway. Similarly, if we have an inhibitor that has a very high affinity for enzyme, even if there's small concentrations of it, this pathway might dominate. So hopefully I'm kind of setting the stage for you guys to see that this Ki value is going to be sort of a significant contributor in terms of the enzyme's affinity for the inhibitor in determining whether or not we're going to have this off pathway. We call this kind of um, decision or choice a bifurcation in a pathway. Bifurcation meaning a splitting or two options that we have. So in this case, the enzyme has two options, to have a productive pathway bind substrate and convert it into product, or an off pathway um, uh, option and bind inhibitor and thus preclude the binding of substrate and so no chemistry happens. So a couple of things to think about here is uh, we can define similarly a Ki value, just like we defined a Km value for over here, a Ki value really again reflects this dissociation constant for the enzyme and the inhibitor. So remember, normally we think about products over reactants, but when we talk about sort of a dissociation constant, it really looks like reactants over products. So small values here are going to reflect very um, high affinity of the enzyme for our inhibitor. So this is gonna become sort of the, the money um, parameter, if you will. When we do sort of kinetics experiments and we're trying to find how effective a drug is, we're really interested in looking at the Ki value. Another term that's kind of important to think about here is what we are defining as alpha. So even though your book sort of defines it as fraction of enzyme that binds to inhibitor, I sort of like to think about this as a scaling factor, asking the question, how effective is the inhibitor? Remember, there's kind of two things that can make for a good inhibitor and thus a robust alpha value. So again, alpha runs between one, meaning there's no inhibition, to something greater than one, meaning we have an effective inhibitor. So two things can make alpha be greater than one, and that's a reflection of this term. 
Again, if we have a high concentration of inhibitor, that's going to make the denominator large and contribute to an addition to one here. And or if we have a um, enzyme that has a very tight affinity for an inhibitor, so Ki being very small, one or both of those are going to allow for a significant um, a numerical value here that will increase the value of alpha beyond one and will have an effective inhibitor. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to see here how alpha contributes to what we see on our um, graphical data. So again, if we want to think about how alpha sort of appears in the um, modulation or the uh, manipulation of our michaelis menten equation here, we can see that alpha here appears with the Km term. And this is really important because what this tells us is that alpha, again, being always greater than or equal to 1, alpha is going to make Km appear to be bigger than it is. We'll get to that on the next slide here, but these are some, kind of some uh, hallmarks that we see for competitive inhibition. Remembering that any inhibition is going to decrease the reaction's velocity, but specifically with competitive inhibition, we're going to make Km appear larger. The substrate is actually going to appear to bind more weakly. The enzyme is going to appear to have less of an affinity for substrate. Well, and that's because there's another choice for the enzyme to have to bind the inhibitor. Again, a Km being larger means we're going to have to have a higher substrate concentration in order to reach that half maximal activity. But one thing that's really important with competitive inhibition is that we do not change Vmax. We don't change the inherent maximum velocity that our reaction can get to. We're just going to need higher concentrations of substrate to get there. In essence, remember when we said if we lived in a sea of substrate, it's almost like the enzyme can't find or see or bind the inhibitor anymore. So high concentrations of substrate allow us to stay on pathway all the time and allow the reaction to reach its maximum velocity. So what does this look like sort of on our standard um, uh, plot here, our standard initial velocity plot. Well, like we'd expect, if we have no inhibition, we see sort of a standard curve here. Halfway to our maximum value is going to reflect a Km value um, that is uh, an important kinetic parameter. As we increase the concentration of inhibitor here, what happens is our reaction becomes slower. What we can't see from this plot is all three of these lines will eventually reach the same dotted Vmax line here. It's just going to take higher concentrations of substrate to get there. So because Vmax is not changed, our one half Vmax isn't changed, but we can see that we intersect these lines at different points, which means that we get out to higher and higher substrate concentrations in order to reach our um, maximum or our uh, half maximum velocity. So again, Km appears to be larger. We can define this as kind of Km apparent, and Km apparent really is that alpha term applied to Km. As we discussed in our previous slide, as long as we keep increasing our substrate concentration, we'll eventually overcome this inhibition as our substrate is going to outcompete the uh, competitive inhibitor. And a hallmark of competitive inhibition is we don't affect the ability to get to this, to this max maximum velocity. We're just going to need a higher concentration of substrate to get there. If we look at this data on a line lever burke plot, it kind of reflects the same sort of data. We said that Vmax was not going to be changed, and so we'd expect these all to have the same y-intercept, and they do. However, we do know that Km becomes larger. So as we have our inhibition sort of um, uh, creeping in here, so again, this green line being no inhibition, stronger and stronger inhibition, our slope gets steeper. Remembering that our slope is a reflection of Km over Vmax, and if Vmax is not changing, meaning the value of our denominator is not changing, that must mean that the value of our numerator is. And so we can say that this alpha really goes in front of this Km, we saw that before. So the alpha is really how much this slope is increasing. So hopefully this makes sense. If the slope is always equal to Km over Vmax, and the slope becomes larger because we have an alpha multiplied by our Km. If we take the ratio of these two slopes, the inherent Km and Vmax values are going to um, cancel out, and that will allow us to determine what this alpha parameter is. So here's why this is ultimately really important. 
we can put that alpha value into this equation here. And because we know the inhibitor concentration we used to get that alpha, that can allow us to calculate the Ki value. Remember I said this is sort of the money value when you're doing uh, drug studies. You want to know what is the enzyme's affinity for substrate, and you can use these kinetic data to get there. Again, we already sort of highlighted this, but when we plot things as a straight line, y equals mx plus b, our slope is km over vmax, our y-intercept is 1 over vmax. These are the kinetic parameters we're interested in, but they're not things that we can directly measure. So we measure things we can measure, like reaction velocity and substrate concentration, and we plot our data in a way that we can get from the slope and the y-intercept useful information. We spent a little bit of time in class talking about just kind of an example of competitive inhibition. There's tons and tons of examples of competitive inhibition, but kind of uh, one that has an interesting set of side story is the uh, ability of alcohol dehydrogenase to either use methanol or ethanol as a substrate. Sort of the normal biological purpose that we have alcohol dehydrogenase is for detoxification purposes for something like ethanol, which is a biological toxin. So in that case, this enzyme works in this direction to convert ethanol to acetaldehyde, and that allows us to effectively metabolize this toxin specifically to something that is semi-volatile and could be um, actually breathed out. Now, we talked about in class two, in a few uh, class periods in lab, we're actually going to brew our beer. And so uh, yeast are actually able to run this reaction in this direction, um, alcoholic fermentation will actually convert um, some carbohydrates ultimately into ethanol and carbon dioxide and that's how we generate alcoholic and carbonated um, adult beverages. So again problem here is is if you have methanol that you've accidentally ingested. Methanol is a toxin because it is also a substrate for this enzyme so will bind in the same way that ethanol does Chemistry is similar in that it does oxidation chemistry. Oxidation of methanol generates formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is hugely toxic in your body. We talked about that is uh, how they used what they used to used to use to preserve tissues. So, kind of jokingly, but very seriously, how you treat methanol poisoning is you actually can administer IV ethanol. And the idea is, is that because these two will compete. For the same binding site on alcohol dehydrogenase, you want to make sure that alcohol dehydrogenase finds ethanol before it finds methanol and give your body enough time to clear this water-soluble toxin from your body rather than allowing it to react enzymatically with alcohol dehydrogenase. All right, uncompetitive inhibition. So this looks similar in that we have sort of this on pathway um, uh, option, you know, what we'd expect our enzyme to do with our substrate. But what's different with uncompetitive inhibition is where the inhibitor comes in and binds. So again, in this case, the inhibitor is going to bind not to the substrate binding site, the substrate's actually already bound. It's going to bind to an alternative site on the enzyme um, substrate complex, and in pulling this out um, from the uh, this equilibrium here will actually make the uh, enzyme appear to bind substrate more tightly, make the enzyme appear to have a higher affinity for substrate. So again, this off pathway, it's thought to alter the enzyme um, activity site, so it changes the shape, um, probably effectively putting it into a T state. And so we kind of talked about this a little bit in class. Um, this might be a little bit intuitive or counterintuitive, right? But when we think about, well, wait a minute, enzyme is bound to substrate here. Must the, the enzyme must be sort of in the R state there, and it probably is. Enzyme is in the R state, it's bound to substrate, but what happens is the uh, inhibitor is going to sort of sequester this here, it's going to bind an alternative site, and what happens is there's a, a, a somewhat distortion of the enzyme active site, probably making it more T state so that it can't allow it to do chemistry with its substrate. Um, so again, this is a little bit uh, less intuitive to sort of think about, but again, inhibitor is going to bind to this uh, preformed complex and uh, form this, this uh, enzyme substrate inhibitor complex that is not able to uh, undergo chemistry. So a lot of what we see on the next few slides are going to be very similar to what we saw for competitive inhibition. We can define um, an uh, affinity constant here for um, our inhibitor.
so our ki value this just has a prime here to remind us that we're considering sort of uncompetitive inhibition here alpha is defined in much the same way it's a kind of a scaling factor that's going to be greater than or equal to one that reflects not only the inhibitor concentration but the enzymes affinity for that inhibitor so everything else is pretty much the same here in terms of how we think about it the only thing that's really different is how and where the inhibitor binds. If we think about what happens with uncompetitive inhibition, we can see that the alpha here appears in a different spot. We're not really gonna talk too much about um, how that uh, comes into play here, but uh, just highlighting again that when we have inhibitor that binds to um, the enzyme substrate complex, uh, it presumably distorts the enzyme active site such that it renders it inactive. So again, probably pushing it into a T state here, probably was our state to productively bind enzyme there. But again, by sequestering this from this equilibrium by the inhibitor and forming this enzyme substrate uh, inhibitor complex, we distort the enzyme active site, presumably making it semi-T state. Um, not necessarily interfering with the ability of that substrate to stay bound, but uh, precluding any chemistry with substrate. So um, one of the things in your homework was to actually have you guys think a little bit about how sort of a standard initial velocity plot might look for something like this. But uh, it's easy to see how this plot is a um, double reciprocal plot is different than what we saw for competitive inhibition. So again, with competitive inhibition, we're gonna see um, uh, that Vmax is unchanged. So for uncompetitive inhibition, we do see a decrease in Vmax. Because we've sort of handicapped our enzyme, we're not gonna be able to reach that maximum velocity. And we can see that sort of played out here by the fact that we have different y-intercepts here. And so alpha really is um, uh, reflected here in our Vmax. Right, uh, our, our ability to sort of have competitive or um, inhibition here is reflected in the decrease in Vmax. Again, we talked about Km sort of appearing to be smaller. Um, we can think about this from this Le Chatelier's principle. But again, if you take a look at the homework questions that ask you to think about um, what is going on here with, with Km, we can kind of look at this mathematically as well. So again, slope being Km over Vmax, if we know that Vmax is becoming smaller and the slope is unchanging, that also tells us that Km must be smaller. So we definitely can see that Km is smaller from our langweaver burke plot, but make sure to take a look at the homework problems that asks you to think about sort of that initial velocity plot and uh, be able to see in those cases too, uh, because Vmax is decreased, why Km must also be smaller. Sort of a hallmark here, we cannot overcome this inhibition. The fact that Vmax is decreased, it doesn't matter how much substrate we throw at it, because substrate is actually bound to the enzyme already, throwing more substrate at it is not going to actually overcome this inhibition. There's no competition between that substrate and the inhibitor. So again, very binary here in considering things either to be competitive or uncompetitive. Your book talks about mixed inhibition, really which kind of combines both of these and is just sort of a big um, kind of mathematical mess. We're not gonna consider that. We're really gonna kind of keep this very dualistic here in thinking of either uh, competitive or uncompetitive inhibition. All right, the last little section here with our kinetics is thinking about how we control enzyme activity. And really we can control activity in metabolic or enzymes in metabolic pathways uh, by not only controlling the activity, but controlling the availability. So I'm not gonna mention too much about this other than to say I want you to know that controlling things in the long term probably involves kind of upregulating or downregulating synthetic and degradation pathways for these enzymes. But that's really sort of inefficient from a resource standpoint if you're constantly making an enzyme if you want to have it do its job or breaking it down and degrading it if you don't want it to do its job. So that might be something that we consider sort of developmentally for long-term control, that if you don't need an enzyme to be doing its job because you're in a certain developmental phase, well then don't make it and make sure that you degrade it. We're gonna focus in this chapter, and for the most part in this course, on short-term regulation. So we're not controlling whether an enzyme is actually there, we're just controlling whether it's off or on, so controlling its activity. Two main ways that we control whether enzymes are on or off is through the binding of small molecules that we call allosteric effectors, and ultimately that kind of changes um, 
uh, enzymes to be T state or R state. So again, they just affect the ability of the enzyme to really effectively bind its substrate and do its chemistry. Additionally, we can talk about phosphorylation states. So again, having kinases or phosphatases add or remove phosphates specifically from serine, threonine, and tyrosine residues, and that helps to modulate activity. We've been talking about phospho and dephospho states since the beginning of the course here, so we're finally going to kind of see a few enzyme examples for how this plays out. And as we're going to see with the enzyme that we'll study um, with this section of our kinetics chapter, often both of these are kind of in play. We can so sort of think about this like a fail-safe. If it's a really important enzyme, we sort of have a double switch. If we want this to be off, we want to make sure it's T state, and then we're going to have whatever phosphorylation state is indicative of that enzyme being either on or off. And remember, different enzymes are going to be on or off depending on their phosphorylation state. We'll kind of summarize that here uh, again. A Little bit of a busy slide here. Um, and again, I'm just going to highlight here probably three times or so. Um, either having a phosphate on or off can make the enzyme on or off. It depends on what that enzyme is designed to do. So even though my little picture here shows that a phosphorylation makes an enzyme active, that's going to be specifically for the enzyme we're talking about today. That's not a general concept. Some enzymes might be more active if they're phosphorylated. Some actually might be less active if they're phosphorylated. But at the end of the day, we're going to have kinases that are going to use the gamma phosphate, that terminal phosphate from ATP, to add a phosphate onto serine, threonine, and, and tyrosine residues. And phosphatases reverse that chemistry. They're going to hydrolyze that off. Kind of going through this process of using kinases to add and then phosphatases to remove phosphates, this is what we refer to as a substrate cycle. We kind of have two kind of different processes happening. Now at the end of the day, we'd be really horribly inefficient if we just kind of kept going around in a circle here because the net cost of going around in a circle here is using one ATP every time we go around in the circle. So we don't want to be constantly decorating with phosphates and then removing phosphates because that is going to be um, energy costly. So what we do want to think about is, well, depending on what state we're in, whether we're in a phospho state or a dephospho state, that's going to determine which half of this substrate cycle is dominating. If we're in a phospho state, we're going to have lots of kinase activity. We define phospho states as energy or glucose need states. So what are some things that would put you in that kind of a state? Well, energy or glucose needs means that you're going to have low blood glucose levels. Um, kind of a hormonal signal that we'll see there is the pancreas secretion of glucagon. And the liver is going to be able to respond to that chemical signal, that hormonal signal. And we're going to break down glycogen in the liver so that the liver can help by releasing that um, globally to sort of remedy that, uh, that problem. If we think about sort of what happens on the dephospho side of this pathway, right, lots of phosphatase activity is going to be removing lots of phosphates from um, from serine, threonine, and tyrosine residues. We kind of highlighted too that these residues likely need to be on the surface because if we're going to have other enzymes kind of coming close and then using ATP to add those phosphates, we kind of need to have access to those. So these are going to be surface residues that we have here. So a dephospho state we defined as a fed state. So what are some signals that we've learned about thus far that represent a fed state? Well, high blood glucose levels. High blood glucose levels means your pancreas is going to be secreting insulin. And then in our transporter chapter, we learned about how we can use um, insulin sensitive transporters like GLUT4 in order to be able to pull in glucose from the bloodstream. Again, if we consider um, uh, adipose tissue that's doing this or uh, muscle tissue, muscle is going to pull in glucose and it's going to replenish its glycogen stores. But once those glycogen stores have been sort of uh, filled up, if there's any excess glucose, then the adipose tissue will continue to pull in through GLUT4 receptors that glucose and will convert it into triglycerides. The liver will also be able to do this too, but again, the liver uses GLUT2 receptors. All right, so a little bit here to learn about one enzyme, and this is just kind of a preview of the kind of studies that we'll do as we learn metabolic pathways. We're really going to be learning a lot about how these enzymes work. So glycogen phosphorylase, which is kind of an important enzyme here, um, so important that we often just kind of call it by its last name, phosphorylase. 
Uh, it is an enzyme that breaks down glycogen. So reminding you what glycogen is, this is the uh, starch, uh, st starch, the starch glucose polymer in animal uh, muscles and liver. And kind of maintaining proper glycogen levels has to do with a balance between synthesizing glycogen and breaking it down. So again, another one of these substrate cycles that we've talked about. So we have to carefully regulate what's going on in this pathway. When we study this next semester, we'll actually talk about glycogen storage diseases, and we'll talk about several diseases um, that have some significant implications uh, for health. Um, one other thing I kind of want to highlight here, and it's one of um, uh, the things to just kind of uh, think about here is maintaining blood glucose levels is so important that we kind of have multiple ways to sort of remedy that. We're learning about what I'm calling a top-down approach where you take glycogen as a polymer of glucose, undergo glycogenolysis, so the breakdown of glycogen, to make free glucose, your liver does this, can remedy that blood glucose by uh, kind of putting this out to the bloodstream. If you used up your glycogen stores, you can actually go through a process of gluconeogenesis in your liver. That's where you take non-carbohydrate precursors and you use this metabolic process to convert them into glucose. And then again, you can take that glucose and distribute it um, globally to your, uh, through your bloodstream. This is kind of an important uh, point to, to kind of highlight that glucose even though we need it in our body and we need to maintain five millimolar uh, blood sugar levels, glucose is not what we consider essential. Remember, something that's essential means your body can make it. So glucose is not really essential because we can make it. We can make it from non-carbohydrate precursors. So we're gonna focus on sort of this top-down approach uh, where we take glycogen that's a certain uh, number of residues. We undergo what's called phosphorolysis when we talked about the breakage of glycosidic uh, linkages with lysozyme in our enzyme chapter, we talked about hydrolysis. Phosphorolysis means we're going to not use water as a nucleophile, we're going to use phosphate as a nucleophile, breaking that glycosidic linkage, but now we're going to generate glucose 1-phosphate. So rather than there being an OH group here, there's going to be a phosphate here. So this is glucose 1-phosphate, which we abbreviate G1P. So in times of need, when we've got low blood sugar levels, uh, this process is going to be upregulated in your liver, and we're going to, again, break down glycogen to generate glucose. And again, we talked about here this bottom-up approach. We also can use gluconeogenesis as a mechanism to do the same thing. Uh, when we're in times of plenty, for example, if we've eaten, we've got high blood glucose levels, uh, we're actually going to downregulate glycogen phosphorylase. We don't need to be breaking down glycogen. We're actually going to upregulate its counterpart glycogen synthesis to allow us to store energy as glucose. So we'll get to the details of that um, next semester, but hopefully it makes sense that we're going to have kind of an alternative um, pathway and enzyme that's going to be operational when we have uh, high glucose levels. So uh, just highlighting again, covalent modification is the addition or the removal of phosphates by kinase or phosphatase enzymes. Um, when we talk about covalent modification, if we're talking about um, a little italicized A after an enzyme name, that refers to the active form. B refers to the less active form. And just reminding ourselves that the A doesn't necessarily mean it's phosphorylated. It depends on what that enzyme does. So because phosphorylase is most active when it's phosphorylated, phosphorylase A is phosphorylated. Thinking back just briefly to this enzyme for glycogen synthesis that we call synthase. Synthase is actually going to be most active when it's dephosphorylated. So synthase A is dephosphorylated. Hopefully that makes sense. This enzyme is also subject to allosteric regulation. It's gonna have small molecules that it can bind and sort of regulate its enzyme activity. So two that we're gonna discuss here are the fact that ATP being sort of a fed state signal is gonna inhibit phosphorylase and AMP is actually going to activate phosphorylase. So the last thing to sort of think about here is um, what this means structurally. So this looks like there's a lot on this slide, but at the end of the day, Everything that's in yellow is stuff we're really gonna ignore. That's parts of the enzyme that are not really involved in sort of regulating what's going on here. Just reminding ourselves, T state versus R state. T state is again a confirmation that's not conducive to binding or doing chemistry on substrate. R state is conducive to binding or doing chemistry on our substrate. So ultimately what determines whether this protein is T state or R state? 
is the position of the N terminus. So in T state, this N terminus, which we again can't see very well here, but it's buried. So a buried N terminus in phosphorylase means we're in T state. An exposed N terminus means we're in R state. So we're going to talk about a couple of things here that allow us to determine whether or not we're in T state or R state. So importantly, right here, we have a critical serine residue, serine 14. If we phosphorylate serine 14, we add a negative charge right here. So a couple of things happen here. Not only do we not want to bury that negative charge inside this protein structure, remember the interior of a protein structure is relatively nonpolar, so we're not going to want to put a charged residue in there. But we also have a critical arginine residue that we have here. Arginine, again, being a positively charged residue, is going to form a favorable electrostatic interaction with this phosphorylated serine, kind of locking it into the R state. So this is sort of an example of sort of this double uh, scenario here, where we're going to have um, the R state is kind of locked in by the phosphorylated form. One of the things that we didn't really talk about too much in class, but we'll just kind of highlight it on here, we mentioned that ATP is going to be an inhibitor and AMP is an activator. And this seems really a little bit odd, right? Because the only thing that's different structurally between these is two more phosphate groups that are added on there. But truthfully, that can be a really significant thing for structure. So what we're going to have is we're going to have ATP and AMP bind to what we call an allosteric effector site. We're not going to discuss where it is on this protein, but when it binds to that allosteric effector site, if it is ATP, it binds and locks in the T state. If it's AMP, it binds and locks in the R state. So again, we're not going to get into the structural details, but you can kind of imagine that we're going to have the additional two phosphates must be interacting with something that allows us to lock in the R state, that when we don't have them there, we can be in the T state. So kind of summarizing here for phosphorylase, really we funnel into two of four possible states, right? Even though the binary case of R and T and the binary case of phospho and D phospho suggests there could be four possible states, really we only have sort of the doubly off state, dephosphorylated T, or the doubly on state, phosphorylated R. And again, we highlighted in our previous slide, right, why we're not going to have something that's phosphorylated be T state because we can't bury that um, negative charge. So we always are going to have what I refer to as a logic check when we um, try to understand how an enzyme is working, right? So most of the time, you know, again, this is why I've been sort of highlighting this phospho versus dephospho. If you can have kind of in your brain what's going on with phospho, again, being a need state, uh, glucose or energy need state, D-phospho being a fed state, if you have sort of that overarching umbrella and then you sort of understand what an enzyme does, that automatically tells you what must be happening with that enzyme in order to make it active. So for example here, we know that glycogen phosphorylase breaks down glycogen and makes more glucose. So if we're going to be making more glucose, we need to be in a glucose or an energy need state. So we must be then in a phospho state if we're going to be having glycogen phosphorylase be active. Okay, that also reminds us that phosphorylase must be active when we're adding phosphates to it. And again, we looked structurally, yep, that's the case. When it's phosphorylated, it's in the R state. So again, these are what I call logic checks. And if we keep this umbrella of phospho versus dephospho state in our brain, we're going to be able to make these logic checks much more easily. So again, if we're in a fed state, we're going to have lots of ATP around. We're going to have plenty of glucose. Um, we're going to be in kind of a, a, um, a D-phospho system, so lots of phosphatase uh, activity going on. That's going to sort of funnel us into this D-phosphorylated T state. We're going to be inhibiting the break, breakdown of glycogen. Conversely, if we're in a need state, again, we're going to be uh, eliminating these inhibitors, so we're not going to have a lot of ATP around. We're going to be doing a lot of kinase activities. So we're going to be phosphorylating things, funneling ourselves to the most active state, phosphorylated R, and again, activating glycogen breakdown. We sort of already mentioned this, but we can think about this from the synthase standpoint. All right, if we're in a fed state, we're going to have lots of glucose around. 
we want to upregulate glycogen synthase because we want to use that as a mechanism to kind of take care of those high blood glucose levels. We want to synthesize glycogen and store it in our muscle and our liver. So if we're in a fed state, that also means we're going to be doing dephosphochemistry, so we're going to have lots of phosphatase activity. So that tells us that synthase must be most active when it's dephosphorylated. Okay, run through those logic checks in your head. I know we didn't learn about synthase here, but that logic check should make sense to you. Again, similarly, if we're in a need state, if we're decorating things with a bunch of phosphates because we got lots of kinase activity, we're going to be decorating synthase with a phosphate. So decorating synthase with a phosphate means it's going to be inactivated, inhibited. Well, that's important because if we're in a need state, we don't want to spend our energy making glycogen. We got to be breaking it down to release that glucose to help with our low blood sugar level. So that kind of represents the end of what we want to think about for enzyme kinetics.